All right, good evening. Good evening. Oh, my goodness. Take two. All right, good evening. Good evening. Now, that's more like it. Welcome to Scripture Memory Ministry. It is a pleasure to be here, and everybody's been asking, where is Mrs. Barker? Well, she's at home because she's going to be having an operation next week, and she has to get ready for it, so you pray for her. But the good news is she has lost 54 pounds as this morning. Amen. Uh, going out speaking and dieting don't mix, amen. <laughs> so uh, anyway, you pray for her. It is uh, a little on the serious side, but I think she's going to be feeling a lot better when it's all finished. Uh, so pray for her. And I pray for me as I travel back. I even cancel one meeting because I want to be home to take care of her. Right. So I believe my place is at home. And so you pray for us. And uh, I have a special surprise for you tonight. A lot of you say, do you have any new books? Yes, we do. Amen. Besides the big honey-do list I had during COVID-19, <laughs> uh, I also finished this. I started it in, uh, in February and finished it up during the COVID-19. This is titled, The Bible Way of Soul Winning. The Bible Way of Soul Winning. There's a lot of interesting things in here. I was raised in a preacher's home. So what I did was I put together a lot of the things that I learned through the years. And also traveling around the country, uh, I do a lot of door-to-door -door soul winning, a lot of talking to people here and there. Uh, also the witnessing at the prison of inmates of about every religion under the sun. I included a little of my experience from that. So you got the five parts the Great Commission is in here about going door-to-door -door soul winning to the do's and don'ts. About uh, leading a soul to Christ, God's simple plan of salvation is in here. Also, discipling a Christian, uh, the silent partner is in here, all of that. And, and the end of the book is Bible ammunition, some verses for you to have to use for soul winning. This is only $5, so you want to come back and get your copy. Be more than happy to help you out. We take cash, checks, or credit cards. Yes, we're up to date. <laughs> so uh, you come and see me afterwards, and I'd be more than happy to help you. All right, if you have your King James Bibles... Please turn over to the book of Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 13. And we ask that when you get there, that you stand out of the respect of God's word. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 13. Familiar passage. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be the withstand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rules of the dark of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take upon you the whole arm of God, that you may be the withstand on the evil day, having done all to stand. Tonight I'd like to talk to you about where is your armor? Where is your armor? Let's have a word of prayer and we'll begin. Our wonderful Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of being able to serve you. I'm only your servant. I cannot do this myself. I ask that they hear you and your Holy Spirit tonight and that you will convict hearts as only you can. In Jesus' name we ask all these things. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I brought a friend with me tonight. Some of you are saying, what in the wide world is this? I had a little girl come up here, bless her heart, and she wanted to see it. And so I introduced him to you, her, and what his name is, is Arnie. This is Arnie the Armadillo, and uh, he's special to me. I picked him up in Texas in February. At the end of my southern tour, we did a revival meeting in uh, Burnett, Texas. It's right near Colleen, not too far. And they have a store down there, a grocery store called H. E.B. Uh, okay, you're familiar with the pastor. That's right. And outside, they have yard ornaments. But they don't look like the yard ornaments that you would see at Walmart and all that up here. They're quite different. And one of the, the uh, yard ornaments they had was a longhorn steered cow. And I almost bought him. But they wanted almost 60 bucks for that. And I thought, well, <laughs> and I'm looking around. Then I saw this guy. And I thought, oh, yeah, he was a lot more reasonable. So I bought him. And I took him back to the propice chamber, and I Skyped my wife, and she says, oh, I like him. He's cute. 
and we're going to put him in the front yard. And I said, okay. Well, I was driving on the way home at the revival meeting and took one look at this guy. He was in the front seat on the floor, and I thought, bing, he's not going in the front yard. Not quite yet, because he makes a perfect, perfect sermon illustration. So Arnie is going to kind of steal the show tonight, but uh, he's very important. Armadillos, the reason why they're called that is because they have lots of armor on them. All this is all armor, but underneath... There is no armor. Why? Because this is the way God designed them. And when he gets in trouble, somebody's after him wants to try to have him for a meal. What he does is wraps himself up in a ball and they can't get at him because his armor protects him. Just that simple. They come in three different sizes. One's this size, then there's a medium sized one, and then a small one. Uh, don't worry, he won't bite you, I promise. But anyway... Arnie has a question for you. You see, Arnie always has his armor on. When he goes to bed, he doesn't take it off. When he gets his bath in the, in the, in the pond or whatever, he doesn't take it off. He always has his armor on. His question is, where's your armor? Sure. You see, we're not like Arnie. Some of us Christians wear armor once in a while, but then sometimes we take it off. And that's when we get ourselves in trouble. And so that's why Arnie asked that question, where is your armor? Amen. And so tonight we have about uh, five questions for you to help you to understand how important it is to have your armor on. So if you're taking notes, there's going to be five questions and, of course, some verses underneath. You know me, I always have to have some kind of Bible verses here and there. But anyway, uh, we're going to have five questions. And the first one is this. Are you having your daily devotions? Amen. Are you having your daily devotions? You say, preacher man, do you realize who you're talking to? Do you realize that we've got a pastor that's constantly getting us in our Bibles, and this is Twin Port Baptist Church, and when the snow's flying, it's at six inches and six feet deep, that thou, that's all we do? No, wait a minute. <laughs> Not everybody does. That's right. And that's why I ask this question. You see, because I'm a preacher's kid. And I know that people can come to church and be what they call secret agent Christians. Oh, yeah. They come to church with the King James Bible. They dress up and they look real good. They sing the songs. They say, amen. They put their money in the offering plate. But when they go home, it's a whole type of a different story. Sometimes the Bible is put down and it's not picked up again to the next service. You say, you got a beginning. Oh, no. Or sometimes it's read one day and then skip a day, red day, one day, or sometimes two days or whatever. My question is, are you having your daily devotions? Amen. The Bible says in Job 23, verse 12, Job 23, verse 12, Neither have I gone back to the commandments of his lips. I esteem the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Amen. You are what you eat. Now, we're Baptists. We love to eat. Amen. Amen. Come on. Amen. Amen. Yeah, uh-huh. All right. So, a lot of you, when you get home from church tonight, after hearing this bald-headed preacher man, you're going to say, well, you know what? I got the nibbles. And what are you going to do? You're going to go to the cupboard or the refrigerator. You're going to get something to nibble on. You know why? Because you're hungry. Let me ask you a question. When's the last time you had a snack? In God's word. Right. When's the last time you had a snack in God's word? You see, we got it all down. Some of you might be having your Bible reading every day, but all it is is just a routine. You open your Bible, you look at your watch. Okay, here we go. On your mark, get set, go. Tick, 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 beep. Time's up. All right, pastor, I read my Bible. Question, how much did you get out of it? Right. The Bible goes on to say in Psalms chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Blessed is the man that walketh not the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Amen. You're looking for something to chew on. You're looking for something to meditate upon. Psalm 119, verse 97. Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Psalm 104, verse 34. My meditation of him shall be sweet. I will be glad in the Lord. It's about time we start reading and meditating on God's word. Yes. 
Now, I just came from farm country. Believe it or not, there are people up there. Some people think there's more cattle than there are people. That might be true. But believe it or not, this, this church ran, brother, about 60, 70 people. Amen. That's just one church. But, you know, it was perfect for them because most of them raised cattle and cows. So I use this illustration. But, you know, you got a bunch of cows around here, too. I know you do. You watch them cows. You know what they do? They chew their cud. That's right. They take their meal and they chew on it. You know, we can learn from that. We need to chew our cud. Several years ago, my second oldest sister, Margie, her husband is a pa was a pastor. He had to retire because of health reasons down here in Burlington, Wisconsin. Well, we had our Thanksgiving dinner at the church, and it was nice. And afterwards, my sister had set up this big table, about the same size as my back table, and it was full of goodies like pickles and olives and potato chips and potato chip dip and green peppers and all that stuff. And she said, all right, family, now I know we're going to be having puzzles to put together and games we're going to play and a singing time and whatever, but, you know, he said, if you get the nibbles, you come on over here, we got some grazing food for you. And you can come over here and graze any time you want. Well, you know me. And my nephews were there, and I looked at them, and I said, hey, watch this. Mmm, Margie. Moo. Grazing food. Moo. Oh, we had fun that day. And they all caught on. They go, oh, yeah, Margie, guess what? Moo. Grazing food. Grazing food. But we got all done, and I'm on my way back to Milwaukee, where I was uh, the assistant pastor at that time, and traveling with this ministry. And I looked at my wife, and I said, you know what? That would make a perfect sermon. Grazing food. So I put it together. And the next time I came back to that church to preach, it was about three months later. Guess what I preached on Sunday night? Grazing food. Just for my sister. Amen. But you know, there's a lot to that. We need to be grazing on God's word. Yes, amen. You had to have your daily devotions. Why? Because this is your spiritual food. And if you don't eat, you're starving to death. And then people wonder why they can't make the right decisions. Then people wonder why they have so many problems. Then people wonder why they can't raise their kids right. I'll tell you why. Because you're starving yourself to death. Yeah. And that's why sometimes it's important not just to read your Bible in the morning, but once in a while have an afternoon or an evening snack. I worked at a prison for 18 years as a correctional officer. I wasn't allowed to carry a Bible. And there were many, many times I wish I could have pulled my Bible out to get something refreshing to read. Because, you know, sometimes you get that wear and tear, especially when you're being harassed by Muslims and devil worshipers and Jehovah Witnesses and one right after the other, sometimes all at the same time. So what do I have to do? Well, I had to pull it from my heart. I had to use the verses from memory. But I'll tell you what, when I got home and I opened up that Bible, it was a lot more valuable to me, right. a lot more precious. Amen. And I thought about these people in foreign countries that would give anything just for a page of the Bible. And here we got all kinds of King James Bibles all over your house. My question is, is are you reading them? Are you meditating upon Amen. them? Do you treasure them as you're supposed to? It's so, so, so important. Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6 says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest they be proved thee, and thou be found a liar. Many times the inmates would say, Preacher man, what religion are you? And I would say, I don't have religion. I have the Bible. You should do the same. Here's a second question. Does the Bible control your thought process? Does the Bible control your thought? process. Interesting, isn't it? Now, I'm sure you're familiar with this program. It's called Reformers Unanimous. We have it back at our church. And for some odd reason, I get to preach there quite often because I'm used to working with these type of people. And I do this about four or five times a year. So I got very familiar with the 10 principles. And I think it's principle number three says, every sin has its origin in your heart. Or before you ever did it, you thunk it. Oh, yeah. Before you ever did it, you thunk it. Right. Where is your thought process? Right. How do we control it? Well, I'll tell you how. It's with this book Amen. right here. This is why you're memorizing verses, not just to quote them for Sunday school. Not just to say, I have it, Pastor. Here, you want to hear me say it? No. You memorize it to put it in your heart. 
so they can use it. Let me get you some ammunition. Psalms 119 verses 113 through 115. Psalms 119 verses 113 through 115. I hate vain thoughts, but thy law do I love. Thou art my hiding place and my shield. I hope in thy word. Depart from me, your workers of iniquity. I will keep the commandments of my God. Try quoting that the next time you have some horrible thoughts. Amen. How about Proverbs 16.4? Proverbs 16.4. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. Right. Proverbs 16.4. Proverbs 23, verse 7. Proverbs 23, verse 7. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he, but his heart is not with thee. And then 2 Corinthians 10, 5, 2 Corinthians 10, 5, casting down imaginations and every vain thing that worketh against the knowledge of God and being into captivity. Every work, what? According to the beatings of Christ in time, we go with the verse. You see, these are not just verses to me. They mean something. It's your thought process. Now listen carefully to this. One of the things that I taught in reformers just recently was how to overcome an addiction. And I remember I got up there and they looked at me and thought, what does he know about an addiction? He's never smoked. He's never drank. He's never done drugs. He's a preacher's kid, you know. He's been spoiled with all this stuff. He was born with a King James Bible in his hand, you know. But you know what? I had an addiction. He said, you did? Yeah, it was called sugar. Yeah, I got away with it for 62 years. And then Dr. Terry Coomer, bless his heart, stuck my finger in a family camp and my blood sugar was 258. Woo -hoo 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 -hoo. He said, guess what, brother? You need to go to the doctor. But before that happens, you need to cut out all sugar. Ouch. Oh, yeah, I was having Little Debbie's. I was having A&W root beer by the case, you know. And I was having lemonade with extra sugar in it and ice cream and ice cream floats and, you know, and all this stuff. Well, not anymore. I've been now a diabetic about three and a half years. But I had to make a decision. I had to make a decision that my body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. I had to realize that if I'm going to keep on preaching and travel the way I do, I've got to have this under control. So I made a covenant with God, a vow before God, that I would no longer be a sugarholic. And so I read labels. And you know what? I don't cheat. People say, oh, it's okay. You can have a bite of this. You can have... No, no, I don't cheat. Ask pastor, what did I have for dessert? Sugar-free pie. First thing I said, is it sugar-free? Why? Because I don't cheat. You know what? It pays off. My blood sugar was 103 this morning. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And I get, a, I, get a, I get a good report from the doctor every, every time I go. My, my A1C is down more. Why? Because I don't cheat. You see, so it has to start with the thought process. Yeah. You think about it, because I look at that food, it looks awful good. And everybody else is enjoying their wonderful sweets. And I thought, man, I'm missing out on this. But you know what? I have had to overcome that by using the Word of God. And some of the verses you have right here in front of you is how I did it. You see... This is the way it hits home. A lot of think, well, we don't have the terrible thoughts the drunk does down the road. Yeah, but you've got thoughts in your mind. You've got temptations in your mind. How in the wide world are we going to control all that? So, here's the third question. Are you walking in the Spirit? Are you walking in the Spirit? The Bible says in Ephesians 5.18, It be not drunk with wine, words in excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. Galatians 5 verse 16 says, This I say, then walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Galatians 5 25. Galatians 5 25. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And then Galatians 5 verse 1. Galatians 5 verse 1. Stand fast therefore in the liberty which Christ had made us free, and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. Yeah, now, the church I was at in Milwaukee, the reason the pastor wanted me was two reasons. One, I, I needed more meetings and time to do it, so I was able to travel a lot more. But he also wanted me because all the members just about were all ex-druggies, ex-druggers, or ex inmates, or all three. So one night we were teaching about being filled with the Spirit, and I asked this question. I said, how many of you have ever been drunk? Oh, Pastor Barker, <laughs> yeah, we've all been there. <laughs> yeah. And I said, okay. What do you have to do to keep on being drunk? Oh, Pastor, that's easy. You got to keep on drinking. I said, that's right. So let's turn this around. How do we keep on being filled with the Spirit? 
We've got to keep on drinking the word of God. We've got to keep on increasing our new nature and getting rid of the old nature. John 3.30 says, he must increase, I must decrease. You know what? We all have an old nature. And if we don't control it, it's going to take control real quick like. And before you know what's out of control, and we're not walking in the spirit. I remember I was sitting in an officer station one afternoon at the prison. And this Pentecostal guy walked up to me, you know, thank you, Jesus guy, you know. And there was about six inmates around because I guess they knew what was going to happen. And he walks up and says, preacher man, have you ever been anointed with the Holy Ghost? They don't say Holy Ghost. They always say Holy Ghost, right? Well, anyway, he says, have you ever been anointed with the Holy Ghost? I said, oh, yeah. I said, I got that when he was saved. I said, no, 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 preacher man. Has anybody ever come and put their hands on you and anointed you with the Holy Ghost? And I said, no, they don't need to. Oh, yes, preacher man, you need to be anointed with the Holy Ghost. I've been anointed with the Holy Ghost, and I'm filled with the Spirit. And I looked at him, and I said, no, you're not. And the inmates all got a big smile on their face, like, give it to him, preacher man, give it to him. And he said, well, how can you know that I'm not? I said, well, let's look at the Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting with verse 4. It says, charity suffereth long. And is kind. Charity is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemingly. And so on and on I went with this. And I said, you know what? You're all puffed up. You're bragging about how you're filled with the Spirit. I said, that's not the way it goes. I said, these are all fruits of the Spirit. And not only that, I've heard you in this dorm. You cuss like a sailor. You might go to your meetings and say, thank you, Jesus, and wave your arms all over the place. Then you come back and you look at your filthy magazines and you cuss like a sailor. I said, you're not filled with the Spirit. Right. He walked away. And the inmate says, preacher man, I'm glad you said that. We've been trying to get him to be shut up for five weeks. <laughs> you know what? We claim to be filled with the Spirit. But it's a day-to-day -day process. Yes, it's important that you realize this, that we need to continually be filled with the Spirit. And that's why it says, be not drunk with wine and success, but be filled with the Spirit. You've got to keep on drinking this Bible. You've got to keep on crucifying that old nature. Number four. Number four, what armor are you using to resist temptation? Hmm. What armor are you using to resist temptation? How do you do it? Now, some people might do it this way. Put them up, put them up. I'll fight you with one hand behind my back. Or they might say, all right, devil, don't move. I got you covered. Or they might do it the Pentecostal way. I rebuke in the name of Jesus. Yeah, that's how some people think they resist the devil. Is that how we're going to do it? Well, let's see. The Bible says in Romans 13, 14, Romans 13, 14, But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. What does it mean to put on the Lord Jesus Christ? Do we put them on like we put our shoes and our clothes on during the day? No, that's not how we do it. We need to put on the Lord Jesus Christ because he's the one that set the example. Take your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4, please. He's the expert. And while you're turning there, let me say this. A lot of people don't realize this, but if you study your Bible and the four Gospels, and then look at Hebrews chapter 4, about verse 15, it says that Jesus was tempted at all points like as we are, yet without sin. You see... The temptation here in Matthew chapter 4 was real. But Jesus was tempted a lot more than that. He was tempted at all points, yet resisted it every single time. You say, well, he was God. Yeah, well, why is it in the Bible? For our example. And I think we should look at how he did this. And ironically, you look at this passage and it says, when, and now Jesus being led, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. He was led by who? The spirit into the wilderness be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterwards and hungered. Whoa. I don't think that fit too good in a Baptist church now, would it? We got hungry just after watching somebody preach. Can you imagine going 40 days and 40 nights without food? That's right. No potato chips, no nachos. Yeah. No chocolate milk, no popcorn. Oh, I'm making you hungry, huh? Yeah, I know how that goes. But you know what? He hit him right where it was. And when the tempter came out to him, he said, if, the, if thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. What did Jesus do? But he answered and said, it is written. Men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Verse 7. 
It is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Verse 10, it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. As a result, verse 11, then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. It is written, it is written, it is written, it is written. And if you get that through your head, then you won't have such a hard time memorizing these verses. Because you realize that this is your armor. And the reason why we cannot resist temptation is because we're not used to doing it under this armor. We're used to doing it in our own flesh, and it doesn't work that right, way. Right. We've got to use the Word of God. Right. Everything Jesus did, everything Jesus said, every place Jesus went was all according to the Bible. A couple of years ago, I was in Seneca, Pennsylvania, preaching for a good friend of mine. And they have a beautiful piece of property and so I went out to do some thinking and praying. They got this huge mound. It's one of, one of those sewage mounds. I got one at home. And I'm walking around and I, my imagination's going wild. I could picture Jesus up there in this mound in the grass, preaching the Sermon on the Mount to his disciples and all those people, you know, he fed. And I'm thinking about this. And I thought of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7. And then it hit me. If you have a red letter edition King James Bible... 99% of those three chapters are all read. Do you realize that all of that, what Jesus said, became pure Scripture? Hello! Yes. And you wonder why he was so good at it. Because every time you read, have you not read, have you not seen, and what they have to, and he turn around and fire a verse at them. Like Matthew twenty two twenty nine. Jesus saith unto him, you do err not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. John 5, 39, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, for they are they which testify of me, and I know we could go with this. Why? Because he believed in using the armor of God. He set the example. He just didn't walk this earth to, to heal the blind and make the lame to walk. He set the example for us so we as Christians could put on the armor of God that we can put on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's so, so important. Right. Now take your Bibles, if you will, to the book of Psalms, chapter 40, verse 8. Psalms, chapter 40, verse 8. Then we'll go on to the last question, but I want to cover this a little bit. I want to park here a minute. The very important verse. It says, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is where? Within my heart. God's will is always according to God's word. Period. That's it. God's will is always according to God's word. So the next time you get this wild idea in your mind and you walk into Pastor Wagonshoe's office and say, oh, I know this is God's will. Oh, yes, it's God's will for me. And Pastor Wagonshoe looks at you and says, uh-uh. You say, well, how does he know? He got special connections with God. He's got special connections with the Bible. You see, because if it's not according to the Bible, it's not God's will. So maybe you ought to listen. You know, the Bible does say in Jeremiah 3.15, I'll be give you pastors according to my heart, which will fill you with knowledge and understanding. But if you get a hold of this, you would realize that these verses are there to order your steps. Psalms 119 verse 133 says, Order my steps in thy word, and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. So God's will is always according to God's word. So let's check it out in God's word before we do it. Amen. Right. Amen. 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 And when you start doing that, now you're going to have to memorize some ammunition because you can't always have a Bible with you. Think about that. It's so important. So here's the last question. Are you really trusting in the Lord? Are you really trusting in the Lord? Amen. Wow. Think about that. You see, there's a lot of people that say they're trusting in the Lord. But what they're doing is they're going around and hanging on to other people's coattails for their trust. I remember when I became 11 years old and I got into my Bible and started memorizing Scripture, my dad sat me down one day and he said, Son, there's something I need to talk to you about. He said, The older you get, you need to realize something. You can't depend upon my strength and my spiritual wisdom. You have to have your own. 
In other words, he said, you can't follow on my coattails. You've got to have your own relationship with God. You're going to have to make your own decisions according to the Bible. You're going to have to learn to trust in the Lord by yourself. And that summer I did because I prayed for a bicycle because my mom and dad couldn't afford one. So I prayed and prayed and prayed and trusted the Lord he would give me one. And he did. It wasn't new, but I wasn't complaining. It was a beautiful Schwinn bicycle. All it needed was a new tire. Because the spoiled brat who had it got a brand new bicycle. And then the, the man in the church called and asked if I wanted one. I said, sure, that was a big answer to prayer to me. But you know, that was trusting in the Lord. Psalm 62, verse 8. Psalm 62, verse 8. Trust in the Lord at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Notice it just doesn't say trust in him, but it says trust in him at all times. And then it goes on to say pour your heart out before him. Yeah, sometimes we need someone just to be a listening post to pour your heart out to. You know, that's important, but why don't you try that with God sometime? He's more than just somebody up there like a genie lamp. Why don't you pour your heart out to him and put your trust in him? Think about it. There's people all around this country right now that are scared to death because of this COVID-19. I know it's a real disease. I know it's an epidemic. But wait a minute. Are we trusting in our masks? Are we trusting in the, the medicine or are we trusting in the Lord? Think about it. Now, I'm not complaining, you know, but I, my meetings were canceled for two months. Yeah, the only thing I complained about was the honey-do list my wife gave me, amen? But, you know, I, I shouldn't complain about that. We got a lot done. But, you know, the neat thing about it, even though I wasn't out preaching, somehow our bills still got paid. Somehow there was still food on the table. Somehow there was always gasoline in the tank. You see, because I don't trust in the world, I trust in the Lord. And when you start trusting in the Lord, then you're going to start claiming the promises of the Lord. Like Jeremiah 33, verse 3. Call upon me and I will answer thee and I will show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Or Mark 11, 24. Mark 11, 24. Wherefore I say to you, whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and ye shall have them. We can't trust in the government. We can't trust in our stimulus checks. We've got to trust in the Lord. We've got to trust in the Lord. Amen. And if we don't do that, we're in trouble. Psalm 71, verse 1. Psalm 71, verse 1. In thee, O Lord, have put my trust. Let me never be put to confusion. Psalms 20, verse 7. Psalms 20, verse 7. Some trust in chariots, some in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Psalms 56, 3 and 4. Psalms 56, 3 and 4. What time I'm afraid, I will trust in thee. And God, I will put my trust. And God, I will praise his word. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Wow. And then Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Oh, you know those, but how much have you thought about them? Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And lean not unto thine own understanding in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. I don't know about you, but I'm a human being and sometimes we got a schedule all figured out about what we're going to do for God and God says, uh-uh, we're going to do it this way instead. You know why? Because he's in charge. Amen. Remember that the next time your plans are ruined and you have a big depression fit because God's in charge. He knows what he's doing. Amen. Put him in the driver's seat. Let him do the driving. You just sit there in the passenger seat. Okay, Lord, you know what you're doing. And when you realize that, then maybe you'll get somewhere. How much time I got left, brother? I got one illustration I want to give you, then we'll close here. There was a girl about eight years old that went to this grocery store with her mom. And right there at the entrance, they had gumball machines. And then they had this other machine that looked like gumballs, but they were plastic things with toys in them. And the girl asked mom for 25 cents so that she could get a toy out of there. And she put the quarter in and out came this plastic thing and she opened it up and here was this fake pearl necklace. Oh, she thought that was the most wonderful thing. She put it on right as soon as they got out of the store. She put it on and she never took it off. She wore it to bed. She wore it in the bathtub. She wore it to school. Everywhere she went, she had that pearl necklace on. She was so proud of that necklace. 
Well, her dad was a very godly Christian man and had a wonderful relationship with her daughter, with his daughter. And every night before she went to bed, he was always come up and kiss her goodnight and pray with her and read a few couple of scripture verses. Well, that night after he got all done with that, he looked at her and said, sweetheart, do you love me? She said, oh, daddy, I love you. Would you do anything for your daddy? Oh, daddy, I'd do anything for you. Would you be willing to give me your pearl necklace? Oh, that girl sat there and said, dad. I got to think about that one. And he said, okay, you go ahead and think about it. And for the next two weeks, every night he did the same thing. Sweetheart, do you love me? Would you do anything for me? Are you willing to give me that pearl necklace? Well, finally, after two weeks, the girl knew what was coming. And that night he said, sweetheart, do you love me? And she started getting her lip like this, like, yeah, daddy, I love you. Would you be willing to do anything for me? Yeah, Daddy, I'll do anything for you. Would you be willing to give me your pearl necklace? And all the tears were running down her cheeks, and little by little, her hands were shaking, and she finally took that necklace off, and she put it in her dad's right hand, and her dad reached into his left hand and took out a real pearl necklace and put it in her hand. And she goes, oh, is this real, Daddy? He said, yes. He said, let's put it on you. And he says, you know what, sweetheart? I've had that in my pocket for two weeks, waiting for you to give up this fake pearl necklace so I could give you a real one because I love you. And some of you sitting right here are holding on to that fake pearl necklace. And God's got this big, real pearl necklace he wants to give you. All these blessings he wants to give you. But you haven't really put your trust in him. You're not willing to give up what you need to give up to see God bless your life. It's about time we gave up that fake pearl necklace and put everything in God's hands. Amen. So Arnie has a question tonight. Where's your armor? Where's your armor? He always has his on. How come you don't? Let's bow our heads. Close our eyes. No one looking around. And ask the piano player to come and we'll have an invitation here. But if God spoke into your heart, you need to do something about this.